Well, good morning again. Seems like just yesterday we were together and uh, it's been a quick week. It's been a blessed week. It's been a week filled with joy. It's been a week filled with excitement. It's been a week filled with thankfulness. It's been a week filled with junk. It's been a week filled with heartache. It's been a week filled with headache. And yet it's been a week that we can give praise and thanks to God and everything, right? Pray that you're doing well this morning. It's good to be with you. And uh, we're getting ready to get into the Word of God. I've been excited about uh, being with you this week, as every week. Um, it's probably my favorite time of the week, I guess. I uh, hope it is. But anyway, we're going to pray. We're going to get into God's Word. We're going to continue on. Last week we talked about some tough things. This week uh, we're going to we're going to expound on it just a little bit and uh, see what we can learn. Father, we do thank you. We do thank you and praise you for another day, Lord. It's been a, been a glorious day. It's a day that you have made, a day that we can rejoice, a day that we can be glad in. And Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here to, today and uh, to get to speak with those who couldn't be in our presence uh, live at church, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that that your word would pierce hearts and that we would have ears to hear what your spirit might say to us, Lord. Lord, lead, guide, and direct us, and uh, just help us to get everything that you'd have us to get today, Lord. We love you. We're blessed. We praise you and adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we talked about some things about whether you can lose your salvation, whether a person can walk away from their salvation, you know, abandon it, uh, whether once saved, always saved is actually biblical, and, and different things. So I left off with these questions, and that's where I want to pick up this morning before we get into our text. Number one is uh, the question I left, one of the questions we left off with is, do I believe you can lose your salvation? And my answer to that was no, based upon what the word lose means. It means to no longer have something because you do not know where it is. You've lost it. I don't believe that a person can go along and just lose their salvation. And we ask this question, if you could lose your salvation, at what point is it that you lose it? Is there a certain sin? a certain number of sins, um, a certain time that maybe you're not walking in the Spirit, no one knows. But I don't believe that Scripture teaches we can lose our salvation. Uh, to lose something is, it's, it's not something you wanted or set out to do. Uh, I've never wanted to lose my car keys. I've never wanted to lose my phone. I've never wanted to lose the remote. You know, these things that really drive us crazy in life. Um, so anyway, I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. No. Do I believe, number two, that one can abandon or walk away from the faith? That's one that uh, you get a lot of kickback on if you say yes. And I do believe that a person can choose to no longer walk in the faith. Um, it doesn't set well with people who talk about once saved, always saved. Um, but I believe that you can. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says this. It says, take care, brothers, when you see the term brothers in Scripture, unless you know that it's talking about siblings, it's talking about fellow believers. It says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. To me, to fall away from the living God would be to, to, to walk away, to turn away uh, from Him. And remember, this warning uh, comes in, in Hebrews where the writer, as we've talked about for the last several weeks, is telling them, do not turn away from God and go back to the old law, to the old way, uh, uh, the sacrificial system. So, to me, this warning would, would surely be meaningless and absurd if it was not possible to fall away. Why would we be told to be careful uh, that to, to not do something that would lead us to fall away from the living God if you couldn't fall away. Now, there may be some belief, uh, some understanding in that term that I'm not getting. Uh, but anyway, Colossians chapter, I don't have it. Um, it should be in your notes. Uh, but Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Jesus, it says, Jesus will present you holy and blameless and above reproach before the Father if indeed you continue in the faith. So, if I want Jesus to present me holy and blameless to the Father, 
then according to this, Paul is saying that that'll happen if I continue in the faith. So I believe that there has to be a perseverance, a, a continuance in the faith. I don't believe that you can lose your salvation, but because we're told to continue, we're told to not to fall away, I believe that a person can choose to denounce God, to turn their back on God, and to say, I don't want what you've got to offer anymore, or I don't believe in it. I don't understand talking to God, telling you, telling you don't believe. But uh, anyway, I do believe that a person can step away, walk away uh, from the faith. There's this perseverance thing. Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. He didn't quit, didn't give up. And I believe in our faith that we should not quit, we should not give up, even when times get tough. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment a little more. Number three, uh, does that mean that I believe once saved, always saved? And I've told you, with that technical phrase, understanding as a rule that it means in the sense that just saying a prayer saves me, and by God's grace, He's obli obligated to protect me no matter how much I sin or, or how much I choose not uh, to follow him. No, I don't believe in that phrase, once saved, always saved. First John chapter 3, remember we talked about last week, says, in verse 9 it says, no one, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So to say once saved, always saved in the sense that we use it says, one day I said a prayer, and because I said that prayer, now I'm, I'm eternally saved because by God's grace, He has to take care of me and protect me. So if we're not careful, we use that phrase to say, you know, yeah, I go to church or yes, I said a prayer, even though I'm living in sin, even though I'm living in adultery, even though I'm living as a drunkard, even though I'm living as a thief, as a liar, as a cheat, uh, as a murderer, uh, God's still obligated to save me because I said a prayer. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. No one makes a practice of sinning if they're born of God. 1 John chapter 3. So, number four, do I believe in eternal security? And the answer to that is yes. I believe God's children will be secure throughout all eternity. We talked last week in John chapter 10 that that we're in the Father's hand and we're in Jesus' hand and no one can snatch us out. No one can steal us out. Doesn't mean I can't choose to remove myself. Hopefully I'm wrong on that. I don't believe that I am, but I, I hope that I am because again, I've known people who have chosen with their mouth and with their actions, with their confession to say, I no longer believe in God. I no longer believe uh, in salvation through Jesus Christ. I no longer accept that Jesus is my Lord. And it's easy to say, well, then they probably never knew Him. But th I've known several people who were some of the seemingly godliest people I ever knew, who through some circumstances and through some trials in their life and through some things or just deciding they no longer wanted to have to be held to, to a standard, they said, I no longer believe. So. But anyway, I do believe in the eternal security. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. I love these verses. John says, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these, excuse me, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So yes, I believe for the person who says that uh, they've given their life to the Lord and their heart's desire is to live for Him, even though we mess up, we fall short many times, but their heart's desire is to be a child of God. I believe that that person is eternally secure. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand or Jesus' hand. They don't wanna jump out, they wanna be there. And so I believe that they have eternal security. So as we look at all these things, and there are, like I said last week, there are different groups of people who I believe are God-fearing people, but we interpret Scripture differently. Now, that doesn't mean that we all get to be right. Scripture has to align with Scripture, right? It, um, 
what I read and believe about God's Word in one passage uh, cannot be contradicted and also believed in another passage. If this passage seems to contradict this passage, we know that there's no contradiction in the Word of God, but we know it can't mean two totally opposite things, right? This one cannot teach me that you can lose your salvation. And then I read over two books later, and this one teach me that I cannot lose my salvation. And then both of them be right. I either can lose it or I can't lose it. This one can't teach me that, that um, uh, once saved, always saved. There is no way to decide that I, don't, that, that I no longer want to be a child of God, uh, that I'm eternally secure in that sense. And then this one teach me that I have to persevere or I have to stay strong till the end. They can't be polar opposites and both be right. God's Word says what it says and it means what it means. I say that all the time. Now, again, you can't have two or more competing understanding of the Scripture and all of them be correct. In fact, only one of them can be correct, yet, remember, both of them can be wrong. Can't be, both be right, but they can both be wrong. So as I was preparing this week and I was thinking about some of the things that I'd said last week and whatever, what if, I'm, what if I am incorrect on some of the things that I taught last week? Because what I was teaching, much of it, this person over here would say, well, my opinion is this. This person would say, well, my opinion is this. I would say, well, my opinion is this. I can be wrong in my opinions. And when the scripture, even though it's not confusing, but we don't always necessarily understand it correctly, I can be incorrect on some things that I believe. Now, the important thing is that, catch this, please get this the way I'm intending for it to be. The important thing is that I'm living my life to please the Lord. Okay. If I believe that you can't lose your salvation, which is what I believe, but in reality you can, then I'm incorrect in my belief. But I know this, if I don't want to lose my salvation, then there are some things that I need to do, right? I need to live a life pleasing to the Lord. If I live a life pleasing to God, guess what? I don't have to worry about losing my salvation. If I'm living to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I don't have to worry about losing my salvation, if indeed you can lose your salvation. So there's a way to, even if we may not totally understand something, there's a way to realize that we don't have to worry about it, and that's to live for the Lord. And that's my whole purpose today, is to help us to understand that we need to be living for God. We need to be bearing fruit. If I'm loving God, loving self, loving people, if I'm serving God to the very best of my ability, and if I'm serving others in order to bring glory and honor to God, not to be seen, but to point to the Lord, if I'm bearing fruit in my life, if I'm studying God's Word, if I'm, I'm praying to my Heavenly Father through, through the Lord Jesus, if I'm walking in the Spirit, if I'm, if I'm sharing God's Word with other people, I don't have to worry about losing my salvation if in fact you can, even though I don't believe that you can. All right? If I'm doing all those things and I'm living to please the Lord, I don't have to worry about ever wanting to jump out of the hands of God if, in fact, you can. I don't have to worry about falling away from the faith because I'm living my life in the way that it was meant to be lived as a child of God. I'm living it to honor and serve my Lord. Am I perfect at it? No. Am I perfect in my marriage? Well, you have to ask Alice, Alice that, but the, probably she's going to be honest and say, no, he's not perfect. But my desire is to be the best husband that I can be. So therefore, my actions or my fruit will reflect my desire. Same way with being a child of God. My actions or my fruit should reflect what I say that I believe. You see, in the Bible, fruit is often uh, used to describe a person's outward action that result from the condition of the heart. And in a moment, we're going to talk about conditions of the heart. 
But if my, my, the condition of my spiritual heart is one that, that wants to please God, then I am going to naturally bear fruit. So I don't have to worry about these other things. If I'm wrong about losing your salvation and that person or those persons are right, I don't, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to go around being afraid that I'm always going to say the wrong thing and, and fall out of grace or, or, or maybe think the wrong thing or do something that's wrong because uh, if I do, you know, then if I can lose my salvation, then I'm going to always be fearful of possibly losing it. But if I'm living to please God, I don't have to worry about that. So in the Bible, the word fruit is often used to describe a person's outward action. Catch that. that that's result from the condition of the heart. Is your heart good? So I have to ask myself, and you need to ask yourself, am I producing good fruit? Fruit that's pleasing to the Lord. Fruit that's good for others to taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you producing good fruit? Am I bearing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? So if I'm uh, producing good fruit, if I'm walking in the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit, I don't have to worry about these other things. Yes, I want to know them. I want to learn them so that I can teach them properly. But I don't have to worry about them. I don't go to sleep at night thinking, wow, if I die, what's going to happen to me? I go to sleep at night and just before I do, I pray and I thank God for another day and I and I thank Him for His love and His mercy and His grace. I thank Him for Jesus. I thank Him for the Spirit. I thank Him for all His many, many blessings. And I thank Him for the fact that I believe with all of my heart that I am eternally secure. And should I pass away during my sleep, then I'm going to open my eyes in His presence to be there with Him forever. So I have no fear, no fear of death. I've told you before, I'm not crazy about the thought of suffering, pain, but I have no fear of death. In fact, you know, as a child of God, we should look forward to the day, whether it's the return of Jesus, which I'd rather see, or the fact that I take my last breath and I leave this earth, that I'm going to be in His presence. What is there to fear there? I believe what I say I believe. What is there to fear? You see, you can know the Scripture inside and out, interpreting perfectly, perfectly and yet, catch this, bear no fruit. The scribes and the Pharisees knew the Scripture, but they bore no fruit for God. You see, it's not what you know necessarily, but what you do with what you know. So, what I know of the Word of God is, I'm secure in my salvation. I believe that. What I know is, I don't believe that I can lose it because I have been saved. The blood of Jesus washed away my sin, my past sin, the penalty of sin, the presence of sin, and looking forward to the fact that there will be no more sin in my life, no more presence of it, because I am a child of God and I will live eternally with Him. So let's look at our Bible, it's Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to look at the parable of the sower. And uh, as we look at this, we're going, to, we're going to talk about a few things that will fit in with what we've been discussing the last couple of weeks. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. God's Word says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about Him so that He got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. Remember, that's a perfect amphitheater. Know this, if you're ever out on a boat just offshore, people can hear you a lot better than you can hear them. So be careful. But imagine some critic saying this, you can't do that. This Jesus, you can't do that. Teaching belongs in the synagogue or in some other appropriate place. There are always critics. There are always skeptics everywhere you go. And I'm sure Jesus had a lot of them, as he does today. And he told them many things in parables saying this, a sower went to sow. Now remember, a, a parable is a heavenly truth depicted by an earthly story. But here's something very important for us to understand about a parable. Catch this. A parable is not an allegory. An allegory is a story in which every possible detail has an inner meaning. 
And here's the danger many times that we, that we have with parables. There are people that will take this parable of the sower, the parable of the seeds, and they will try to make every word mean something deep and have a deeper meaning than what the Lord is trying to teach us here. An allegory has to be read and studied, but a parable is heard. And so Jesus is speaking these parables to people for them to hear. Now, if you go on and read uh, just beyond what we're between the parable and the, and the, the, the understanding of the parable, you'll see that, that the disciples said, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus explains to them, there are those who can hear and understand what is being said, but the ones who cannot hear, I don't want them to understand because even by His grace and His mercy, He's given them an opportunity not to understand the deep meaning of it and not to be held in condemnation because of it. So go ahead and read that when you get a chance. But we must be very careful not to make allegories of the parables, not to try to just dig and get more and more and more meaning than what is meant. So a sower went out to sow, verse 4, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on, along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, when we read that and we think, what's he saying? Well, Jesus is getting ready to tell us what he meant by this parable here in just a moment. But remember, parables presented God's message so the spiritually sensitive could understand them. But again, the hardened or uh, would merely hear a story without heaping up additional condemnation for rejecting God's word. In other words, they would hear it, they wouldn't understand, so again, they wouldn't be held accountable for that. In this sense, parables were examples of mercy given to the undeserving. So, understand this. The ground represents the different hearts of the people who are hearing the parable. It's the same seed. He's not throwing out different kind of seed. He's throwing out the same seed, and we're going to see that it's the Word of God. But it's the different hearts upon which they fall. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus is going to explain. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Now, we can read about this also in Mark and Luke. In Luke's gospel, he says this in chapter 8, verse 12, The devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So, picture this. He goes out, he's walking along the path, he's throwing out, the sower's throwing out seed, and, and a lot of the seeds land on the path. Well, the path is where everybody walks, and it beats it down, it pads it down, and it, it's, it's almost like concrete. It's been walked on so hard. So much, and it's, it's become hard like concrete. It's the path where people walked and nothing could grow because the ground was way too hard. And so, the, so Jesus says that the, the evil one comes along and snatches these seeds. Have you ever thrown seed out into your yard just to watch a bunch of blackbirds come and immediately destroy it? It's so frustrating. I did that last year while trying to get grass to grow in my yard. And I, I, it felt like I just had this big bird feeder going on. I'd be out there shooing birds and all that stuff. And anyway, but these fell on hard soil, compacted soil, so that they could not take root. And the evil one comes along and snatches them. Second Corinthians chapter four, Paul talking to the Corinthians, he says something very similar. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, if it's covered up, it's veiled only to those who are perishing, to non-believers, to those who don't want to hear. In their case, the God, little g of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he's, Paul is saying basically the same thing as Jesus is saying. The seed is planted, the evil one, Satan, the God of this world, little g, he has blinded the minds of the believers to keep them from seeing and from hearing and from believing. 
So the evil one comes and snatches the seed from the heart that is not prepared to receive the seed, right? Back to Matthew 13, verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Feelings, emotions, possibly. Yet this person has no root in himself, but endures. He, uh, and Luke chapter 8 says he believes for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, people say, is this a believer? We know the first one was a non-believer. We know that for a fact. This one says that this person responds and immediately receives the word with joy. So does that mean that this person is saved? I don't, I don't believe that... We know that all the, these four hearts don't represent the same situation. We have four different hearts here. We have one that's hard that will not receive the word. We have this one that the Bible says, Jesus says, immediately receives with joy. Uh, back in youth ministry and back when we used to do a lot of revivals and tent revivals and things like that, you could get people worked up. And in, a, in an instant, with feelings and emotions, they would run down and, and pray and receive. I did that at the age of 12, I've told you many times. But it didn't stick. It didn't take root. I believed for a while. Does that mean I, that I was a believer? Possibly. I don't think so looking back, but possibly. But nevertheless, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately this person falls away. Well, remember, Jesus is speaking. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the Jews. And remember, Jesus is telling the Jews that it's time for them to turn from the old way, the old law, the old way uh, uh, of, uh, of offering sacrifices, the old sacrificial system, the old Levitical way, just as in James that we read, or the book of Hebrews, excuse me. And so Jesus is saying that these people immediately receive it with joy, but when they're persecuted or when tribulation comes, when their families are saying, you're no longer a part of us, you're dead to us, when the Jews are persecuting the church and then they're wanting to run back, maybe this represents that person that the, the writer to Hebrews was saying, don't go back there. Don't go back there because when you do, there's, 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 there's no other way of salvation. Don't do it. Maybe this person has made a false profession. Again, different people are going to teach this differently. But what we do know is this person had no root. Their heart believed for just a little while, but when things got tough, this person fell away. Did they walk away from salvation? Did they ever have sal salvation? We don't know for sure. But we know that it didn't take root. Rocky ground places were where the soil was thin. It was thin soil lying upon rocky, a rocky shelf. You know, we have pea gravel out in the, 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 where the bushes and shrubs and stuff are in front of the church. And it'll get just enough soil in it that all these weeds will take root, but nothing of any value is going to take root and grow. You can't grow corn in it. Uh, the plants that we do have planted are deeply rooted down in the ground, so there wouldn't be enough soil for them. So if they spring up, then immediately the sun's going to wither them because it's going to be just tribulation for them and persecution. So on this ground, the seed springs up quickly because of the warmth of the soil, but the seed is unable to take root because of the rocky shelf. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now, when you look in Mark and you look in Luke, um, we see that... It, that uh, in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, it says, It's choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. That leads me to believe that there's fruit, but it doesn't become mature fruit. We see believers all the time who are not growing. They're not being discipled. They're not maturing, as we talked about last week and, and a couple of weeks ago. This person is not a mature believer. Maybe they're still on the milk of the word, but... All these cares of the world and the riches of the world and, 
and um, the pleasures of life prevent this person from maturing in their faith. So maybe this is a believer, but because of everything going on around them, they get their focus off of God, they get their focus off of growing. They don't learn God's Word, they don't grow in God's Word, so the Scripture says they become unfruitful or their fruit does not mature. There are many people in churches today, maybe you're one of them, who would say, I know that I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But you're not growing in His Word. You're not spending a lot of time praying to Him, worshiping Him, serving Him, thanking Him. And so you may be a believer, but you're not a mature believer, and so you're not bearing good fruit for the cause of Christ. I want to look at you and say, it's time to step up. It's time to start growing. Just this week, I've had several people, and Alice has had some women to come up and say, I'm ready to grow in God's Word. And so now we are trying to get them um, um, together with other people, hooked up with other people who do know God's Word so that they can teach them, so that they can disciple them, so that they can now start bearing fruit. So it's very, very exciting. Verse 23, and what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. And he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. You see, good soil describes a soil that is both fertile and weed-free. There's not the cares and the riches uh, of the world to choke it out. There's not the... Uh, there's, there's not the tribulation and stuff that prevent it from taking root. This person's heart is one that says, I want to grow in godliness. I want to bear fruit. I want to learn God's Word. I want to spend time with the Lord. I want to walk in the Spirit. So notice this person, the Bible says, there are different yields, but there's fruit nonetheless. There are different levels of growing discipled believers. There are those who uh, maybe are still on a little bit of milk, but they're starting to eat more solid food. There are those who now have gone to a little bit more solid food, but maybe they're not just quite yet on the meat. And then there are those who are on the meat. And so different believers are, are going to yield different amounts of fruit, but they're going to yield fruit. If you're not yielding fruit, there's one of a two or three things going on here. You're not a believer. You're a very immature believer who's still on the milk. Or maybe you're just, you're, you're, you're growing fruit, but it's just not the kind of fruit that you know that you want. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul says this. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Listen to what he's saying. As we examine ourselves, we're not to look for perfection, because this side of heaven we're not going to be, but we should see real evidence of Jesus Christ in us. We should see real fruit growing. That's where the joy is. Paul asked the, the Corinthian Christians to consider a sobering question. He says, Ask yourself this, am I really a Christian? Do you mind me asking you that? Are you really a Christian? Are you really a born again, names written in the book, Lamb's Book of Life, child of God? And if your answer is yes, then listen to me. There should be a desire. It may be a weak desire, but there should be a desire to be growing in godliness to be growing in the Word, to be growing uh, in your faith, to be bearing fruit. You see, faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary is the key to living the Christian life as God desires. Faith. Do you have faith in Jesus? Saving faith. Are you? Have you examined yourself? Are you truly a child of God? When you have faith in the finished work, listen to me, there will be fruit. Some less than others, but our desire should be to be growing more and more and more fruit. Many in churches today are not experiencing the fullness of God's blessings because they are not producing fruit. 
Are you experiencing God's best for you? Or are you settling for less than best? God does not want his children to settle. He wants us to be growing and going forward toward the finish line, looking for the day that Jesus returns, looking for the day that we're in his presence. If you claim to be a child of God and you're miserable right now, I'm not saying you're miserable because you're in pain or there's some, some tough things going on, but you're miserable. You're not experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control then that means you are not walking in the Spirit of God. And probably what is happening is you're allowing the things of the world to keep you down because you're not experiencing God's best for you. But you can, just like that. You can turn and you can say, Lord, I am ready to experience what you have for me, your best. I am ready to start learning how to study and, and to apply your word. I'm ready to start growing. I'm ready to get off the milk and I'm ready to get on the meat of the word. It's up to you. And I'm telling you, this life will be different. Even though trials will still come, tribulation is still going to be abound. Pain and suffering is going to be right around the corner. Headache, heartache, around every corner. But peace and joy and thankfulness can be in control. So what about you? Are you a Christian? If not, you can call upon the name of the Lord right now. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, He's God, He's Savior, He's Master. Confess it with your mouth and believe that God raised Him from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. You'll be saved from the penalty of sin You'll be saved from presently the power of sin. And in the future, you'll be saved from the presence of sin when the Lord Jesus returns to, to save us, to rescue us from God's wrath that is coming. So what about you? If you are a child of God, get with me. It's time to start growing. Okay? Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, for those who, who don't know you, Lord, that... Today would be the day that they would surrender their heart and their life to you, to have a loving relationship with the God of creation through his son, Jesus. So draw them, Lord, by your spirit, as only you can. And Father, for those who are children of God, but Lord, they're just, life is just not, it's just not good. It's just not pleasing. It's not fruitful. I pray, Lord, that they would just surrender everything to you and walk in your spirit. Thank you, Lord. We are so blessed, and we praise you, we honor you, and adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Again, next week, we're going to be wide open. And so I encourage you to be here with us in person. Love you guys. If you have anything you need, just yell. See ya.